Hi students and welcome to today's live IELTS class. My name is Adrian. I'm streaming to you from beautiful Victoria here in Western Canada. I hope that everybody has had a good week and I hope that you are looking forward to a fantastic weekend. Welcome Harman, welcome Ramon Preet. Hi Scatman, good to see many of our subscribers in the class. Everyone, this is a subscribers chat class. So to join the chat in this class, be a subscriber, click that subscribe button, uh, click the bell button to get notifications of our uh, live class schedules and our new releases. If you're preparing for the IELTS exam, we are world leaders when it comes to IELTS exam preparation with over uh, 1.8 million subscribers helping thousands of students every day, so you're in the right place. Uh, in this class, we are looking at IELTS listening. Uh, specifically, we are focusing on listening parts three and four, and we did parts one and two last week. If you missed that, it's okay. That class is available on our uh, live stream recordings on the channel. You can check that out later. Um, and you can definitely do part three, part four without that class. Um, these topics will be on international trade and the famous artist, uh, Michelangelo. Students, this lesson is presented to you by aehelp.com for academic IELTS success. Visit us there for the general IELTS. Check us out at gieltshelp.com. We will use the website aehelp.com today for the listening audio. We use the materials from our websites regularly in these live classes. So if you enjoy learning in these live classes, spend a couple of dollars and get our materials so that you can follow the classes and learn even more effectively. Um, our uh, website is a one-time payment for lifetime access. You get an app for your phone, you get practice exams, um, you get uh, interactive courses, lesson videos. Uh, simply just click on this big red button. It's a one-time payment right there uh, for lifetime access and um, you're off to the races. You can use it as long as you'd like. Uh, welcome, Carolina, our chat moderator. I see lots more students uh, joining in now. Sabine, Mingma, uh, John, Irani, Agna. Uh, good to see so many of you in the class now. That's fantastic. For the general IELTS, visit us at gieltshelp.com. Again, click that big red button. It's a one-time payment for lifetime access. And we do have uh, this code available for you today. You can use on the websites. The code is IDEA25. We'll get you a 25% discount. So when you are at the checkout, click use coupon code, type in IDEA25, and you will see a 25% discount. If you have questions about the IELTS, I see that, um, Agna asked me, how can I improve my reading? That's a really big question, Agna. There are a lot of steps to improve reading and reading scores. And if you have a question like that, we can give you better advice uh, through email. So you can always send me your questions via email to adrian at aehelp.com. Now, of course, a lot of your questions will be answered on our course and our apps. So if you have IELTS questions, check out the app academic IELTS help check out our app general IELTS help from your app store you get lots of help and answers for free from those apps as well okay so we're here to make sure you succeed uh, we have uh, more classes tomorrow we'll have uh, task one writing and speaking part three for everyone so those are classes tomorrow the task one will be a members uh, class and then speaking part three will be an all chat class and we have special light hall classes this month as well light hall is a new platform it's an amazing platform for live teaching check it out sign up for one of these classes they're free um, you can video chat with me in these classes if you'd like 
Um, here are the links. We'll have a class on the 13th, 24th, and 31st. So lots of classes on uh, Light Hall. Check that out. Um, and uh, definitely check out our latest YouTube speaking video. We just released it a few hours ago. Uh, lots of people have already watched it. There it is. That's our latest YouTube speaking video. It's our best one yet, I think, anyway, in my opinion. It's just very nice and clean and to the point uh, with lots of great strategy, advice, and practice with subtitles, so um, free for you. Sponsored by Cambly, so thank you Cambly for uh, making that a full video for everybody with a full speaking section. Now, uh, listening, right? You're like, well, Adrian, isn't this a listening class? Where are you talking so much? Um, because I want to help you. So all of this information you might think is advertising, but it's advertising to help you. Um, so all of this information is valuable for your IELTS learning. You're in the right place. Uh, listening, it is, yeah. Um, here is listening section three. Now again, this is going to be coming from our uh, website and uh, I'm going to play the audio in just a moment here. So your goal will be to listen and answer. In the IELTS exam, you only get to listen once. You have to answer while you listen. You can take notes. You have note paper in both the paper and computer uh, delivered version of the test, but you shouldn't take lots of notes. You should just listen and answer. There's only a couple of questions where you might take a few notes to help you. Otherwise, you're listening for keywords, you're listening for content, and you're visualizing, you're picturing, you're seeing it, okay? You're interested, you're not zoning out, you're not thinking about pizza that you're going to eat after the exam. You're really focusing on the content and you're staying calm. If you miss some information, that whatever. It's not the end of the world. Don't worry about it because then you'll miss more information, okay? So um, pay attention as best as you can, okay? All right, so what we're going to do right now is we are going to listen and um, we're going to answer while we listen. Don't put your answers uh, into the chat. That's uh, because everybody wants a fair chance to answer. They don't want you to tell them the answer, right? And then at the end, we'll go through the answers. You can tell me the answers. We'll look at them together, and then I'll tell you strategies on how to get some of those answers correct when you sit the IELTS exam. So um, here we go. So basically what I'm doing here now is I'm going to hop over uh, to our Academic IELTS website. That's this one here, okay? Now again, the Academic IELTS website, you can join it by clicking that big red button or you can even try it for free by clicking that green button that's just above my head there, okay? And when you join, you have this My Student account, and in the My Student account, you have computer-based IELTS exams. Uh, you can use this on your phone too, by the way, and you have an app for your phone. You have an interactive course that has a lot of effective and useful strategies developed by our experts. Um, and then you have uh, videos and more and more, and you have audio CDs. Now this is audio CD5 because it is exam five and it is listening section three. That's what we're listening for. So let's get ready to listen. This is going to be about trade, okay? Now you should already realize that because at the beginning of the test you looked at the topics, so you know this is about trade. So here we're going to get ready to listen about trade, okay? Here we go. Now turn to section three. Take some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Listening, section three. 
you will hear a forum discussion between the moderator and two contributors, Dr. Rachel Young and Dr. Ronald Sturgeon, both political scientists at the local university, talking about trade between countries. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Young and Dr. Sturgeon for taking the time to spend this afternoon with us. Thank you for having us here today. Dr. Young, could you give us a little background on the topic of free trade and protectionism, a little history? Well, countries and nation states have been participating in free trade schemes for millennia. The ancient Egyptians, for example, participated in trade with the Arabians across the Red Sea over 3,000 years ago. The Roman Empire imported many goods from outside their lands, especially luxury goods such as silk, which were only available in China. Free trade, however, though, has much younger roots. Could you define free trade and protectionism for us, Dr Sturgeon? Free trade is trade between countries without taxes, tariffs or other regulations attached. Without a free trade agreement, nations charge taxes or tariffs on goods that are imported to their country. This is to protect the manufacturers within their country. If country A, for example, produces a product for a 20% higher cost than country B, country A is likely to impose a tariff on the importation of country B's cheaper product into country A. This is to level the playing field for domestic manufacturers. Free trade advocates want to take down this barrier. In my opinion, advocates of free trade do not care about domestic manufacturers and workers in their own country. I believe their only intention is to maximise profit for big international businesses. I know Dr Sturgeon is impassioned about protectionism, but what he fails to mention is that while free trade may lead to some lost jobs in certain sectors, it leads to many other jobs in other sectors. This may be cold comfort to those in, say, manufacturing or textiles, but we must not be blind to the needs of the many and be distracted by the needs of the few. Nobody says free trade between countries is perfect, but it is certainly better than a protectionist framework which costs the country jobs and prosperity. Another point I would like to make is that free trade increases competition and thus lowers the price of many goods. This saves consumers money. Purchasing a car, for example, is much cheaper under free trade agreements. While such agreements may appear undesirable for a British company such as Land Rover, since they are given price disadvantage within the United Kingdom, this is not the whole story. While it is true that the company is at a minor disadvantage within their home country, free trade agreements puts them in an equally advantageous position in other countries in which the UK has a free trade agreement. You now have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 27 to 30. This is a very interesting discussion. Dr Sturgeon, from reading some of your work, I know you have some ethical concerns about free trade. Yes, I have a number of ethical concerns. First and foremost, free trade agreements incentivize highly unethical sweatshops. When countries such as the United Kingdom enter free trade agreements with countries with lower human rights standards, we put ourselves at risk of tacitly endorsing those low human rights standards. Is the ability to wear slightly cheaper clothing really worth selling out on one of our most basic beliefs, that people should be treated with respect? I agree with Dr Sturgeon that human rights is an ongoing issue in free trade. Certain incidents, such as sweatshops collapsing and killing dozens of workers, have highlighted this issue in the media and public discourse, but these are isolated incidents. Hardly. These are not isolated at all. And even if such horrible incidents were rare, does it make the conditions those workers work in permissible? 
Do we excuse horrible working conditions as long as the workers don't die? That's an incredibly low bar, and one I believe we must implore companies and governments to raise. OK, OK, let's move on. Dr Young, do you believe free trade betters the life of the average British citizen? Absolutely. I believe free trade agreements make us more prosperous as a society. While not perfect, I truly believe pursuing free trade agreements is a positive step in making our world a better place. Of course I disagree. While I do not doubt that more wealth comes into our country as a result of free trade agreements, I believe this money never improves the life of the average citizen. The rich get richer and the middle class workers get laid off. Not to mention the ethical issues I have with it. That is the end of section three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. All right, students, and in that half minute, check your answers. It's very important. I'm just going to stop the audio on our website here. And then we will take a look at the questions and we'll talk a little bit of strategy, okay? And I will um, highlight a few interesting points for you as well. So first of all, as we were doing this, uh, notice how what I did was I looked at some of the key information in each question. So I knew what I would be listening for, okay? Now, I do not recommend circling or underlining in your real exam. In the real exam, just pay attention to the key information. Don't circle, don't underline. Why do I say that? Why do, I, why do you think that I tell you not to circle or underline? And at home, you can, but not in the real exam. Why is that? So at home, you can highlight, circle, whatever you do. Some people do this, some people do that. Circle or underline uh, key information that you predict you will hear. But in the real exam, you should not do this. Just look with your eyes. Why do I say that? So before we get into answers, and I will, I will, I promise you we'll go through all of the answers and I'll give you all the correct answers and you can give them to me as well. But before we do that, let's be intelligent. We can't, we're not just uh, monkeys trying to figure out letters that go into spaces, but we're using our brains. And to do that, we want to be critical thinkers. So we want to think about why we're taking certain steps, what we're doing, how we're doing it. So why are we, um, you know, circling, highlighting, underlining um, at home, but why are we not, why do I tell you don't do that in the real exam? Okay, Amu says it can create confusion. Yeah, I agree with you, Amu. Simply put, but elegant, um, Amu. It can create confusion. So um, in the real exam, if you circle answers, or if, sorry, if I shouldn't say answers. If you circle uh, keywords, this can divert your attention from the actual important information and you will miss it, okay? At home, if you miss it, you can check and see the reason you circled the wrong information. Let me show you what I mean, right? So let's say that you're like me, you know, you're like, okay, this first question, how long ago? And it was, you're highlighting this part here and you're really focusing or you're circling this part. Let's put a circle around it. You're like, okay, it was how long ago? This is important here. Um, but let's say that that's not actually what's important and that's not what the uh, audio really uses or emphasizes. Let's say that it uh, uses this instead, um, first record of trade, right? But because you put a circle around this, you're now not paying attention to that, and you're really just listening to this. 
And suddenly, you know, they say that the original um, uh, record of trade between countries was, and you completely miss it because you're thinking of like how long ago. Uh, now you're confused and you're like, when did they say that answer? I don't know. And it's gone, right? Because you're focusing on the wrong part of the question. So in the real exam, you don't want to um, highlight uh, any part of uh, your sentences. You just want to keep an open mind while kind of focusing on the parts that you think are important, okay? All right, so Lynn is asking, what should we focus on? Lynn, you should focus more on the general, and you can, so you can say, okay, in your brain, Lynn, you can say, I think this is important, but don't highlight it. Keep your mind open for this part as well, okay? All right, so keep a bit more of an open mind while focusing on what you think is the, the clear answer, but don't circle or underline. Um, we did an analysis on students circling and underlining, and we found that um, on average, students who underline and circle answers perform uh, worse than students who don't, okay? So keep that in mind. If you're like, well, Adrian, I'm not sure, you know, like what's going on here? Um, keep this in mind. You can look it up, okay? So statistics show that students uh, who circle keywords tend to get uh, lower scores on average than those who don't. Okay, so keep that in mind. All right, um, so here, because we're practicing, like as if I'm practicing at home, I highlighted some keywords like country A, 20% country B, which are coming kind of directly uh, from the uh, script or the content, but on the real exam, I wouldn't do that, okay? Okay, so let's take a look at this question number 21. How long ago was the first record of trade between nations? Um, and again, you have to master listening for content. So how long ago? Um, and here it says no more than one word. Be really careful about that, okay? Sam says 3,000, Arani says 3,000. Amu says 3,000, and you got it. It is, it's 3,000, okay? So here it's just a number, 3,000. Okay, if you got 3,000, good for you. You're on the right track. Now, in the IELTS, the answers sometimes come quickly, one after the next. Sometimes they come slowly. And here, the next question didn't come for some time. So uh, the um, people were talking for a little while before they actually got to modern day free trade and protectionism. So you have two professors. They're arguing two types of trade. One is free trade, where countries do not pay taxes on their exports, imports. And the other one is protectionism, where obviously an importing country has to pay a tax. Okay. Uh, Tommy, yes, you have to listen and give the answer at the same time. Absolutely. So here, I was carefully listening for this content, uh, country A and country B and 20%, because as soon as I hear that, I know that my answers will be coming uh, for these next parts, okay? And then one of the speakers eventually said, country A makes a profit um, and 20% uh, higher cost than country B, and then they're talking. And then it says the company must pay. Okay, now they didn't say must pay because it's always paraphrased. So you don't hear, especially part three, part four, you don't hear the same words, but you can also use logic. So um, if they don't have free trade, even if I miss this answer, I can probably figure it out. If they don't have free trade agreement, the company must pay a, uh, and uh, Kavya says tariffs. Amu says taxes or tariffs. 
uh, Kavya says tariff. You can only choose one, Kavya. Um, is it tariff or tariffs? It's tariff, right? Why? Because I have a uh, here. Pay attention to uh, the articles. If it's a, uh, then it's singular. And it's a common noun, so it's all lowercase words. It's a tariff. If you write tariffs, plural, you'll get it wrong. Okay, pay attention to the a. Uh. So the company must pay a tariff to import the product. One product, one tariff. This is to level the playing field for who? This was a little bit trickier. Now this is two words and or a number. Okay. Tommy, I don't know who told you that they listen and take notes, but that person has no idea what they're talking about. They definitely should not be teaching the IELTS. Okay, if you're just taking notes while you're listening, you're going to perform poorly. So whoever gave you that advice that they just take notes and they listen and then they answer, that's true for TOEFL exam, but not for the IELTS exam. So if somebody's teaching that in IELTS, they should not have that job, okay? All right, Amu says domestic manufacturers. Um, yeah, and here it's plural. So it was domestic, domestic meaning local, it's the people within the country who produce products. So it's domestic manufacturers. Now, this was a little bit of a you know harder answer because of the English, like some people might not be familiar with the word domestic or manufacturers, hopefully you are. But to help you, you had this part here, um, level the playing field. Okay, and level the playing field has these quotation marks on the two sides. Okay, little cat claws, some people call them cat claws. As they look like little cat claws. Um, and uh, those uh, cat claws uh, mean that the speakers will use the exact language verbatim. So they are going to say level the playing field. So as soon as you hear them say that, level the playing field, you know that uh, the answer will be coming. Okay, let me put that up a little bit. A green screen interference there, okay? All right, um, and then you keep going. Do pay attention to these arrows, okay? Um, the arrows uh, indicate that the information is sequential, okay? So you're listening for this, once it's gone, you listen for this. Now, if you miss this part at the top and you realize this is happening right there, then forget about, you know, missed question, make sure you go on, right? So always try to keep your eyes a little bit ahead of the audio. That's very, very important advice. So try to keep your eyes slightly ahead of the audio. And of course, this is where reading skills are really important. So for the listening section of the IELTS, you need good reading fluency because you need to keep your eyes in front of the audio. Everybody got that? If you're playing catch up, if your eyes are always behind the audio, it will be very difficult to get a good score on the listening section, especially especially part four where they just keep going and going and going and going. So part four is almost like a test of reading fluency at the same time as testing um, listening. And we will see that when we get to uh, the uh, part four, okay? Tommy says, but I get distracted if I look and listen at the same time, like there's a lot of information. Um, minimize. Uh, Tommy, don't try to look at all the information. Um, look at the key pieces of information and don't look at, for example, all the choices uh, for multiple choice. All right. 
Okay, so let's keep going. If the countries do have a free trade agreement, the company does not have to pay uh, to import the item. Some advocates of protectionism believe free trade advocates are only worried about maximizing something for large companies. So what are they maximizing? Irani says it's profits. Yeah, so increasing profits, right? Companies, corporations, maximizing profits, absolutely. And here you need a plural. Ideally, it's profits. And worried about, they didn't say worried about, they said concerned about. So again, uh, paraphrasing, okay? Now do keep in mind, students, this is part three. Part three, they're looking for a higher band. They're looking for band seven, eight, nine. So if you're making more mistakes, it's not the end of the world. You just need to work on. Reading, comprehension, paraphrasing, building your vocabulary, okay? All right, so 24 is profits. Yeah, Tommy, so multiple choice is where you take notes, okay? Not every question, but multiple choice is where you take notes, and I'll show you that because uh, we will get there, okay? So notes are useful for some questions, but not for the whole listening. So you have to be selective in your note taking, and we'll talk about that in one moment. All right, um, so here, no more than three words and or a number. 25, some people will lose their jobs under free trade agreements, but we must emphasize the needs of the something and not be sidetracked by the needs of the. Uh, well, we say this in many languages, many and few, right? So we can't make everybody happy. Our goal is to make most people happy. And that makes sense. Again, logic will help you to solve a lot of these answers, okay? All right. So it's many, few. Here, um, notice that it's the opposite of what they said in the audio. So in the audio, I believe uh, the man says, we must not be sidetracked by the needs of the few and focus on the needs of the many. When I took the IELTS exam last time, there was a question exactly like this where, and it was in the reading actually, not in the listening, where they had this two part answer and it was like something very similar, like many and few, and they did the same kind of trick where they reversed the order. So instead of few first, it was many first and then few after. So they changed the order. So be really careful of the content. The order is important for this type of question. The paper-based exam, okay, you have to put it in the correct order. In the computer-based exam, you're probably dragging and dropping, so of course the order matters. Um, and in the paper-based exam, you would have a space like this uh, for question 25. Okay, and then you have to make sure that you put many uh, first, and then comma, and then few second. Uh, if you do it the opposite way, they'll mark it wrong. So be really, 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 really careful with that. Okay. Thumbs up. Yeah. It's an easy mark as long as you don't mess it up. All right. 26, free trade lowers the price of many goods because it increases logic. Students, use logic. Uh, I bet that you can figure out this answer even if you didn't hear it, okay? So logic is your friend. If there's free trade and you don't have to learn economics, some people are like, but I don't learn economics. You don't need economics to answer this. Uh, free trade lowers the price of many goods. If you have lower prices, you have companies coming in, Samsung, Apple, Hewitt Packard, Dell, um, you've got all these different um, 
options and the prices are lower and lower. It's increasing. Sam says, of course, it's going to be competition. Roshni agrees. Kavya also agrees. I also agree. And every economist and person who's dealt a little bit with looking at their market and looking at how companies compete know that um, free trade increases competition. Price um, Lowering prices increases competition. It's logical, right? So it increases competition. If you wrote the competition, it's fine. Competition is the main idea here. So all is good as long as you got the word competition in there. Okay. Uh, Dona is asking, if I fail the listening, do I have to retake the whole four, four categories? Yes, you do. You cannot retake one part of the exam. That's not the way it works. So, yes. Okay, um, here we go. Uh, write no more than one word. Okay, let's do it. So here, uh, it's a table. There it is. It's a little bit dark, the lines, but you can see that this is a table indeed. Um, and the tables have titles, they have headings. Cause and effect. So you're listening for words like because, since, therefore, okay? So therefore, because, since, you're listening for these connectives because it's cause and effect. So it makes sense that you're listening for cause and effect uh, connectives, right? Of course, that's logical. Um, so pay attention. Enter into free trade agreements. Therefore, they jeopardize human rights standards. Okay, so free trade agreements, uh, it uh, encourages companies to uh, really compete and create some very bad working conditions for people to keep their prices down. And some of those really bad working conditions are sweatshops. Sweatshops, they're a very sad part of uh, global society. Everybody knows what sweatshops are? Anybody knows what a sweatshop is? Unfortunately, sweatshops exist in many different parts of the world. Uh, sweatshops are basically large factories where many, many people are working in uh, close conditions with uh, you know, no air conditioning, um, no proper ventilation, not enough windows. Uh, they're working way too many hours, like 10, 12 hours, and they're being pushed to work, 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 work. Um, that is a sweatshop. The reason why they're called sweatshops is because the people are sweating. It's very hot and they're overworked, so they're sweating. And that's why it's called a sweatshop, okay? Teaching you a little bit of vocabulary there, okay? So a sweatshop is a place where people are working too hard for too long with no air, no ventilation. And... Uh, it's unethical and why it's so that they can create products at a very low cost all right so that's why it's called a sweatshop if you didn't know that word now you do all right um, so uh, sweatshops the conditions are highlighted in the and Kavya and many others are saying it's the media highlighted in the media yeah the news right so you see this on the news um, I guess it depends on the country, but in many countries they show like, you know, uh, this company is producing shoes in sweatshops and t-shirts and sweatshops. It's just not right. So the correct answer here is highlighted in the media, in the news. Okay. If you can use the same word that you hear in the audio. So don't say news, say media. But if you didn't hear it, if and then you're like, oh, I think it's news and you write news, you can probably still get that point, but do try to use the same word, okay? All right, um, the realization that such incidences are not isolated implores companies and, Sam says government, and then Sam changed the answer to governments. Kavya says government and stays with government, but the correct answer is governments. 
Okay. It has to be an S, right? Because uh, companies is an S. So governments, plural, is correct. Government, singular, is wrong because the S. So this is called uh, plural match for noun. So uh, if the first noun is plural companies, it's very likely that the second noun will also be a plural. Governments. Uh, if you write government without the S, I also will mark it wrong. It is wrong. Technically, it's wrong. It's wrong in, in the language. Okay. So uh, you have to use governments. Okay. Implore companies and governments to raise the bar. Uh, Shavam, no, IDP will not allow you to retake only one module of the exam. It's really weird, but there's a lot of strange rumors going around the internet right now with like, the order of the IDP exam is changing and you're allowed to retake one part of the exam. No, these are all false. Okay, nothing is changing and you cannot retake one part of the exam. Now, uh, here's the multiple choice. This is the one that many of you are like, oh, this is, uh, yeah, I can't read all of this. Okay, obviously don't read all of the choices while you're listening. So do not read all of the multiple choice question choices while you listen, okay? Because that's just crazy. And confusing. This is where you want to take notes, okay? Multiple choice questions are the one rare type of question where you should take notes. And there's a different, there's a few different types of multiple choice questions. There, there's the multi-multiple choice question. That one is especially you want to take some notes. So the correct way to solve multiple choice questions is focus on the question and take notes for the answer, okay? Then match your notes with the correct answer, okay? All right. Okay, so um, here we go. Uh, Kavya, don't spam with the answer, it's not necessary. Stop hitting B and enter. Just let your fingers rest a little bit. It's good for everybody, it's good for your fingers. I see the answers, I'm looking at the chat all the time. Once is enough, I'll show the answer anyway. Focus on the strategy. Okay. This is one of the mistakes a lot of candidates make when they're practicing for the IELTS is they're so concerned with the right answer that they don't focus enough on practicing and paying attention to strategies, paying attention to feedback. And then they go to the real exam and they're not getting some of those answers and they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're missing, right? So you have to pay attention to that, right? And here, I was looking at the question. So I was focusing on the question here. What is Dr. Young's main point in advocating for free trade? So it means what is Dr. Young's main point for saying like free trade is good, right? And I took some notes here. Um, he kind of said something like it's not perfect, but it's the best way or it's the right way to, to do it. Okay, so he gave this kind of information. And now, even if I didn't answer it while I was listening, I can answer this later in the test as well. So even if I, because here we have a lot of information, right? So if I don't have time to read all of this, I can just leave this and I can come back to it even later, um, even at the end when I get a few minutes to transfer the answers to the answer sheet or uh, in the computer-based, I get a few minutes to review my answers, I can check then. And that's when I, you know, I read these and I go, okay, free trade agreements are the single biggest economic driver 
for making the world a better place. Mm, not quite. Free trade agreements are not perfect, but they are a good step towards increasing global welfare. That looks really close to my notes. It's a positive step, but not perfect, okay? Uh, C, free trade agreements are not always positive but can be an important way to level the playing field for domestic manufacturers. And here I'm like, oh, okay, he didn't say that, but domestic manufacturers, that's the word that I needed for um, one of those answers where I didn't really hear what they were talking about, but I got that it was something like that. So now I can actually steal these words from here and answer this question here if I didn't really catch it. So if you stay calm, you can actually uh, realize that sometimes the IELTS examiners, hint, hint, will give you um, the answers to tricky questions later on, kind of hidden in some of the wrong answers. Okay, anybody ever see that when you're practicing your IELTS exam or when you did your real exam that there was a really tricky answer, you couldn't really quite catch the words, it was maybe new vocabulary, but you're like, I'm pretty sure that was the answer. And then you were really paying attention and you're like, oh, hey, wait a second, that was it. That's what they said for that question. And then bada bing, bada bam, you go back and you enter domestic manufacturers for 23 and then you're like, okay, I just picked up that clever point by really, really paying attention. Amu says yes, and Dilip Lohar says yeah, a few times. IELTS rewards candidates who are using their thinking caps, their thinking helmets in the exam, okay? So put on that thinking helmet and pay attention. IELTS does not reward those candidates who are just trying to be like robots listening for keywords and dick, 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 dick matching, okay? So use your human brain. That's why, by the way, IELTS became the most popular exam because it's the most human language exam, okay? Sam says, yeah, it's only possible if you pay full attention. Absolutely, that's why you have to pay full attention. Definitely, I think that's kind of what I started this lesson with. So you're right, and Kabia says yes. Okay, all right, so uh, the very last question, same multiple choice, I'm just listening for the answer only. So what is Dr. Sturgeon's main point in advocating for protectionism? So this is the other professor, and they're arguing for no free trade. I didn't really hear him say why that's good, but I heard him say that free trade um, makes the rich get richer and the middle class lose jobs. So that's why we should have protectionism because I guess protectionism helps the middle class to keep their jobs. I don't know if I agree with Dr. Sturgeon, but that's what he said anyway. So let's see if we have any match here. Uh, overall wealth is increased in society. Yeah, no. Uh, middle class jobs are the foundation of an economy that works for the few and not just for, that's a really weird answer. And if I pay close attention, it's a very awkward answer. Works for the few? Question mark, question mark, question mark, emoji. Um, C, free trade agreements are bad because they concentrate wealth in the hands of a few elite. The rich get richer. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, then let's go with C. It's the closest match. Um, here it was B. So number 29 B, number 30 C, and again, you might do this just at the very end um, of the listening if you haven't had enough time, okay? Harwinder says C is the answer. Kavya agrees, Amu and Roshni agree as well. So this is a good example of if you're listening for keywords like middle class, you're like, oh, but he said middle class. Yeah, but that's wrong. It's not word matching. IELTS isn't a word matching game. It's a language exam. Okay, you have to listen for language, especially 
for those high band scores. So if you're looking to get a band seven, band eight, band nine, if you're one of those candidates that's uh, like doing um, a work visa, for example, for nursing or for some kind of medical field and you need that band seven, you must go beyond word matching, okay? Word matching will not be enough for you, all right? You need to think and answer the questions. And that's what we're going to do for the next part, for part four, okay? So part four is coming up. Now, if you uh, did a good job in part three and you're happy with it, great. If not, you need to check the transcripts. If you have access to our websites, to our practice exams, I highly recommend looking at the transcripts on the website. Uh, let's do part four. So let's listen to part four. Part four is nice and fast, no breaks, all 10 answers coming sequentially, one after the next. So pay careful attention. Usually part four is a lecture. Okay. So we're going to hop back to the website here. Um, get ready to listen, to refocus. Okay. And here we go with listening section four. We'll go through the answers after. Do not put the answers in the chat. Save your answers until the end. Here we go. Now turn to section four. Take some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listening section four. You will hear a university lecture on the famous artist Michelangelo. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good to see you all. As you know, we're having an exam a week from today. Material from today's class will be included on the exam, but material from the final two classes of the week will not be included. I hope this will give you an opportunity to revise enough to perform well on the exam. With that administrative business out of the way, I'd like to begin today's lecture on the lesser known works and endeavors of the famous Italian Renaissance artist Michelangelo. While Michelangelo is best known for his painting of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, he was also the creator of a number of other highly respected works. Among these are the Pieta, a statue of Mary holding a deceased Jesus, and the statue David, said to be the representative of the perfect male form. But Michelangelo was not just a painter and a sculptor. One of his crowning achievements is St. Peter's Basilica, a project he was lead architect on for the 17 years preceding his death in 1564. While the basilica wasn't completed until 1626, over 60 years after his death, Michelangelo's influence on the structure was immense as he had laid out many plans for the structure during his lifetime, many of which were faithfully carried out under the reign of future popes and future architects. Michelangelo's fingerprints are all over modern Rome, and especially what is today Vatican City. Not only through his paintings, frescoes and sculptures, but also through his architectural achievements. In addition to his influence on St. Peter's Basilica, Michelangelo also redesigned the famous Capitolini Hill area of Rome, and designed many chapels within the walls of the Vatican. Michelangelo was also tasked with a number of pet projects over the years. These projects were not one that the man himself wanted to undertake, but was compelled to because of monetary considerations or simply loyalty to the Pope. For example, when Pope Julius II ordered him to construct a three times life-size bronze statue of the Pope, Michelangelo had no choice but to accept. The project took up more than two years of his life, and four years after its completion, the work was unceremoniously melted down to construct cannons. Additionally, the conditions under which he was made to work were often sorely substandard. For years, he lived and worked with four other men in a cramped apartment with little to no privacy and no room for his creative juices to flourish. It is interesting to imagine what a genius such as Michelangelo could have accomplished given reign over his own creativity. I personally believe the world is a poor place for him having not been allowed this luxury. However, on the other hand, 
Perhaps Michelangelo's sometimes tortured life imbued his works of art with something more than just artistic genius. Although Michelangelo is a celebrated figure for his works of art and well respected for his architectural acumen, his literary works are virtually unknown to the world. He was a virtuoso of Renaissance art, celebrated in his lifetime and venerated centuries after his death, but his writings never made an impact on the society in which he lived, nor in the years since. Michelangelo was an avid writer of poetry and found that poetry was an invaluable escape from the grind of his everyday work life, especially during the year spent arduously painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Poetry provided an outlet for his frustrations, fears, beliefs, and desires. Those who want to know the real Michelangelo must go beyond his frescoes and sculptures and dig deep into his personal writings. There, one will find a rather tortured soul harmed by years of physical, political, professional, and personal strife. That is the end of section four. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Always use that half minute to check the answers. Um, you can check the answers in the answer key and in the transcripts uh, that you can download from here on the website if you have access to the premium course. Okay, again, to access the premium course, you need to sign up for that. But good news, everyone, we'll go through the answers right now together uh, for this one. But if you want all the other practice exams videos, definitely click that big red button to join our premium IELTS package. It's a one-time payment, a lifetime access. Um, all right, uh, let's take a look at this. So Michelangelo, very famous Italian artist, scientist, if you will, architect. Um, okay, so lecture, uh, was it art history class, I think she said at the beginning, and then um, she gives some instructions to the students. Now, of course, this, you know, for those of you who plan to go to university in an English speaking country, this is typical. It's a typical kind of lecture or discussion uh, by the professor, okay? And um, professors often start the class by uh, saying, you know, what is going to be on an exam and what won't be on the exam. Students are very curious about that. Um, I think, yeah, let's look at this. So um, A, if it's on the exam, B, if it's not on the exam, these ones were kind of easier answers. So 31 material from the third class of the week is B, it's not on the exam, that's right, Irani. So she very clearly said what should be uh, on the exam or what will be on the exam and what will not be on the exam. So B, use capital letters for this, okay? And material from the current class. So this material about Michelangelo, number 32, very clearly she says materials from this class will be on the exam. So these were kind of give me points, okay? Which is nice, They're they're nice to have especially in part four that are kind of easy and you don't really have to overthink them. So for those of you who got those correct, awesome. And then she goes into uh, talking about Michelangelo. Now Michelangelo, uh, hopefully you know some information about Michelangelo. Okay, Michelangelo is one of the most important uh, Renaissance um, figures in history and you don't have to know a lot about history but you know knowing a couple of names like da Vinci and Michelangelo they're very famous you see they're they're referenced in movies in um, cartoons and literature all over the world in almost every kind of a language. So if you have a little bit of um, worldly knowledge, that's a great idea. You know, like I know that some countries really internalize their knowledge. So they really focus on knowledge that's connected with their country. But on the IELTS exam, okay, definitely read up on global information as well. So for IELTS, you want to do reading on international information and history from east to west. So 
it doesn't just mean Europe, in this case Italy, or it doesn't just mean Canada and the US like our last class, which was a reading about um, the border dispute, but even um, Asia. So uh, learning a little bit about the big dynasties in China or the bigger empires uh, in uh, Japan or the conflict between North South Korea or the history of uh, Vietnam. So you want to have, or the Middle East, of course, as well. So um, how Saudi Arabia was formed uh, as a country in the 20th century, or Africa as well, how Africa was colonized by Europeans and the different African nations that were formed. So you want to have global knowledge, South America as well, the original inhabitants, the Incas, the Aztecs, um, the the uh, Spanish conquests into uh, South America, um, the difference of why Brazil is uh, Portuguese and other parts of South America are Spanish speaking. So you want to know these kinds of global pieces of information, okay? And when you do that, you come across some very important famous people like Michelangelo, okay? All right, now pay attention to uh, these um, subheadings like other works, okay? And you have to be quick here, you have to listen and read. This is where reading, listening, answering at the same time is tested at the highest level. Part four is the most challenging part of the IELTS exam for many. Um, and you have to be quick and accurate here. So while Michelangelo is perhaps most famous for painting the Sistine Chapel, he is also famous for a number of other highly respected works, including the Pieta and the statue named what? Triduk Fum says that the statue is named David. And it is. So the answer is David, big D, it's a name. Okay, thought to symbolize male beauty. David, name, male name, Capital D. Okay. Uh, Sam says the speed is higher, which I listen to YouTube. Uh, yeah, by the way, that's a good point, Sam. So this is like the real exam. Keep this in mind. Uh, this is like the real exam. Um, careful, and this is an important one. Many uh, YouTube uh, listening examples are not like the real exam. They are slower and easier. We get this comment, uh, Sam, from so many of our students like, oh, I was using like practice materials from YouTube and then I got to the real exam and I was shocked. They were speaking way faster. Yeah, we make our materials to match the real exam. Um, and you should be very careful because there's a lot of uh, exercises and you know they're okay for helping you improve your listening but you still need to use the same kind of materials as the IELTS to get the real experience okay everybody got that that's really important okay there are a lot of materials out there online and on YouTube that are not like the real exam and we're always so sad when students are like in a shock when they get to the real exam. They're like, whoa, what, what's going on? This is way faster than YouTube, way more complicated, okay? All right, this that you just heard for part four is very much like the real IELTS exam. Uh, when I did my last exam for the IELTS, because I take the IELTS exam, so we know what the real exam is like. Uh, we test it with the real exam. When I took the real exam and I got band nine in the listening, and part four was about controlling insects in Australian agriculture, so farming, and it was just as fast. It was a lecture, it was about uh, insects in farming in Australia, and it was just as fast as this, okay? All right, so if you thought this was too fast, get ready, real exam will be the same. Okay, um, architectural achievements. So we got the first one, David, for number 33. Let's keep going. Uh, Chayan Kip, um, Cambridge past exams, IELTS books, they're gonna be pretty much the same because they're past exams, right? Other ones like Web IELTS, probably not, okay? 
All right, so let's keep reading. Let's get refocused here. So architectural achievements, that's the topic here. So far more than just a painter, Michelangelo was also an architect. He was lead architect on St. Peter's Basilica for something until his death in 1564. Correct answer here, two words, number and a word, 17 years. Okay, you need both of these to get it correct. If you write the word 17, yes, it's correct, but um, it's more challenging to write the word 17, so use the number. Okay, uh, though the structure was not completed until 60 years after his death, his fingerprints are all over the resulting structure because future something and something faithfully carried out his designs future popes and architects you have to get both of these right if you heard it why because we have the word pope right here so you can see that it's spelt with a capital p um, and uh, so if you write popes, you can write it with a capital P and with an S. You have to get architect right and the spelling right because the heading here is architectural. So you have most of the word right there, architect, right? And you just have to write an S at the end, architects. So if you're like, I don't know the spelling though, but I never write this word, it's in there. Just keep your eyes open, okay? Faithfully carried out his designs. Michelangelo's influence is also apparent around the rest of the city of... Now, this was tricky because they kind of give you a couple of different names. Um, but if you pay careful attention, you figure out that the right answer is Rome. Not Vatican. Vatican is just in the very center of Rome. It's a small part of Rome. Again, this is where knowing a bit of your world history is really important. Uh, Vatican is the epicenter of the Catholic uh, uh, faith. It's like knowing that the Kaaba stone in Mecca um, is kind of an epicenter for uh, the Muslim uh, faith, okay? Uh, or um, Tibet is an epicenter of uh, the uh, Buddhist faith. So uh, knowing certain um, key pieces of information, uh, again, will help you, okay? Um, Vatican is, is important, but Michelangelo's works can be seen all over Rome, the city that actually surrounds the Vatican, okay? All right, um, servant of the papacy. He was also a loyal servant of the Pope. Okay, sometimes this was important work, though sometimes it was rather pointless. He once built a something of the Pope only to see it melted down for cannon parts. That is so sad. Just imagine how much that statue would be worth today. Uh, very visual. Blah, 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 blah. This statue being melted down. Amu says it's a bronze statue. It is a bronze statue, Amu. Bronze is a um, common word. It's like gold or silver. Okay. Um, and uh, visual. Use your vision. When you're listening, you should see the information. You should see this big statue of the Pope being melted down into a military weapon a cannon humans are crazy um yeah so poor guy probably spent quite some time i think he said two years building it <laughs> somebody makes a cannon out of it sad all right um moreover the something he had to work in were often substandard uh, the what? The environment? Eh, kind of. Conditions. That's right, Irani. The conditions. Logic tells me that. I can guess that word if I don't catch it in the audio. So the conditions he had to work in um, were often substandard. Okay. 
working with lots of other men. All right, literary works. How strange. I didn't know this about Michelangelo, but I've learned something new. Um, Michelangelo wasn't just a painter, sculptor, architect. Michelangelo was also a poet. Poetry. Of course, people were really into poetry in the past, not just in Europe, but in Asia and in North America. People still are into poetry, but I think a few hundred years back, people were really into poetry, right? Now we have movies and TV shows, and I don't think people are into poetry as much, but poetry is an expression of feelings and emotions, right? Most people know that. We, poetry, feelings, emotions. Uh, these days we replace that with movies um, oftentimes, but it's no surprise that Michelangelo dabbled in poetry. So it is interesting to think what he could have made if he was given the freedom to explore his own creativity. Hopefully you got that. And I see that uh, Scatman, Roshni, Tsayan Kip, um, Fum, a move very good creativity yeah that was an easier one to catch I think as long as you know that word while his life may have been difficult some people argue that this difficulty made him a better artist perhaps something was an important way to escape the difficulties of Michelangelo's life that was poetry right we just talked about it Poetry, express your feelings. It's kind of like a diary, right? Poetry, Irani, careful with the spelling. P-O-E-R-T-Y, poetry. Start of the sentence, so it's a good idea to use a capital letter, but, uh, you know, if you forget that, I think they'll still give it to you, right? But do pay attention if the word is starting the sentence. Poetry is the right word here. All right. So there you go, there you have it. Now, I wanted to check one answer. Somebody said that should have been C. Um, yeah, no, 29 is B. Somebody thought it was C, but no, it's B. Uh, okay, everyone, so that's uh, part three and part four. Now, my question to you is how did you do? What did you get from 20? So what was your score from these 20? Ideally, if you're going for a band seven or higher, especially if you're going for a band eight, band nine, you want to get at least 14 or more of these correct. If you're going for a band eight, band nine, you gotta get 17, 18 of these correct, okay? Amu says 18, Jassy says 18, that's pretty good. Yeah, if you've got eight, if you got 18 correct in part three and part four, you're flying, you're, you're doing awesome. All right. Uh, Chan Kip says, I wrote poultry. <laughs> and then I changed it to poetry. That's funny. Um, yeah, Shub, 10 is a little on the low side. Uh, lowest, 16 is good. All right. By the way, students, you can check what your mark is worth, especially if you did uh, the uh, part one class. So um, at the bottom of our uh, website, at the very, very bottom, uh, you'll see a score calculator. Uh, it's a kind of special link. Okay, it'll say score calculator at the very, very bottom. It's like out of the screen for you. So uh, if you go to aehelp.com, aehelp.com, if you're not there yet, um, you can check out the score calculator. Click on it. Let me just show you that real quick. So uh, click on that. Boom. And there it is. Okay, uh, score calculator. So if I got uh, like, let me zoom in a little bit, make it a bit bigger. So let's say I got like 30, then uh, you'll see that uh, if you got 30, then that's a band uh, seven. Okay, you can see that above my head there, right? So you can check that out. Um, and that score calculator is on our website as well. Okay. No, the pattern of IELTS didn't change. It's a rumor. Okay. All right, um, that's it right there. That's how we do it. Um, and that's listening part three and four. I really do hope that everybody enjoyed the class. And if you did um, and you want to see HD videos uh, on your phone and through the app, uh, definitely join our Premium Alts 
package, click on that uh, red button, the join now button. You can use that discount code IDEA25 when you do that. For general IELTS, it's here, gieltshelp.com, okay? And then, uh, yeah, use that code. Um, there it is, the code. Um, here it is at the top as well, so there we go. Uh, so IDEA25, 25% discount, aehelp.com gieltshelp.com. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow. Task one writing for members and speaking uh, part three for everybody. We'll do a speaking class. We'll speak to people through the website, which will be fun. Uh, no, there's no new pattern for the IELTS. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Carolina, for moderating the chat. Always great to have you helping out. Um, thank you all of our subscribers. This was a subscribers chat class, so of course subscribe to the channel, click the bell, get notifications. I'm Adrian, I'm signing out for now, but I'll be back tomorrow at the same time with a couple more classes. So I hope that you have an awesome rest of your day wherever you are in the world. Much love to all of you. You're all beautiful, smart people, never forget that. And uh, I will see you tomorrow. Bye for now.